Uh, morning to you all. Uh, so, what is going on? A yeah, busy week, actually. Uh, here in the UK, we got the budget. Uh, press is full of speculation and all sorts of stuff about where they're going to take the money from to give it to others. It sounds like a shuffling of the pack, really. Um, but otherwise, uh, stock indices, you're all doing pretty well. We have a quick look at the there's the s p i did, was actually just staring at the uh japan j p n two two five that's the nikkei and that's the index that everyone tracks in japan record highs broke its thirty four year high last week extraordinary taking that long yeah uh, and the um nasdaq well we know the nasdaq powering ahead um yeah so all doing um pretty well it, Bearing in mind, you know, you've uh, got concerns about sticky inflation, as we call it, inflation that's not coming down quite as quickly as expected, although that PCE data last week was good, um, or was as expected, I should say. That's uh, this um, number here last Thursday. Can't even find it. Why can't I find it? Uh, wrong week. Yeah, PCE data. Somewhere, anyway. It's there. It's in there somewhere. I think it's on Thursday, wasn't it? Yeah. The, the personal consumption expenditure data, that's the one that the Fed looks at pretty closely. Anyway, um, despite a lot of data releases, actually, uh, Owen, uh, every 100 days, the US debt increases by $1 trillion. Owen, that's a happy thought. I tell you what you should do. Have a look at this US debt clock. This is this this is really fascinating. If you want to see something frightening, how numbers increase, this is real time. Wait till it comes up. It's just loading now. There you go. Have a look at that. That's the federal tax revenue, but this on the left hand side is the, the national debt. It's going up in hundreds of thousands every second. It is frightening. And what's also a bit frightening, uh, I can't find it here, but it has the number of Americans who receive food stamps. And it's so shocking. Uh, anyway, it's somewhere there. It's something like 30 odd million. Just extraordinary. So, yeah, usdebtclock.org. That's uh, what you want to have a look at. Um, anyway, so uh, we were talking about the uh, data releases, but thank you, uh, Owen. All, always very interesting. All, uh, comments all greatly received and questions. Um, so, these, the data last week, but not brilliant, really, apart from the PCE data. Um, but I think major indices are sort of posting further gains as the NASDAQ goes into record territory, the, the S&P 500 goes into record territory, the uh, S&P Eurostocks, sorry, the uh, Eurostocks 600, that's the top 600 stocks in, in Europe, new, ter new highs, record highs. And you'd be sort of forgiven to think, well, hang on, we've got inflation, we've got wars raging in the Middle East and in Ukraine. Why so bullish? Well, I, I think the feeling is that they're not escalating quite as much as some had feared initially. Uh, and we've also got inflation coming under control. And I think I think that US GDP data last week, the consumer sentiment reading, the European CPI data all missed um, consensus. But I think it probably was offset by that personal consumption expenditure data that we were just looking at. Um, plus 0.4 percent on the month. There we go. Plus 0.4 percent on, which is a 2.4 percent annualized. The PCE data, um, as it's referred to, this personal consumption expenditure. A bit of a clumsy title, isn't it? Uh, why is the gold price not rising? Said Owen. Gosh, Owen, you are a greedy so and so. Gold was uh, through the roof last week, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, well, wait, not rising today, but it's jumped. Friday, but on the back of the PCE data, I, I, I suspect. Um, anyway, um, good PCE data, and I think 
I think analysts expected a fall from 2.6 to 2.4 percent on this PCE data that I've just uh, referred to. Um, and I think it now supports the expectation for the first cut from the Federal Reserve at the June meeting. Do you remember we've got this Fed Watch tool where we can, these are the dates of the next FOMC meetings, one on the 20th of March, one on the 1st of May, and then June is the first meeting when you see, oops, let's go to it. June is the first meeting where you see expectations for cut in rates from five and a quarter, where they currently are, to five to five and a quarter. So that's what we're expecting on the 12th of June. US and inter international indices jumped Thursday and Friday. So when you look at the S&P 500, you can see that jump Thursday and Friday. Um, let's zoom in a bit, actually. Thursday and Friday last week. And I think that PCE data basically soothed concerns that inflation data might be stronger than the Fed would like. That wasn't the case. Uh, the core PCE reading, uh, which is that one there, um, came in as expected on the annualized reading of 2.8%. And it suggests that that real built-in inflation, which excludes those components that pushed inflation up initially, energy and food, that's also waning in line with the headline rate. Um, of course, we've got two more um, monthly readings before the Fed is expected to cut rates in June. So nothing is certain, as you all know. We talk about it one week and then next week it's contradicted and the market reacts, but that's the ebb and flow, the inhaling and exhaling of markets. Um, what propelled the market higher? Uh, the NASDAQ, particularly strong again, as you can see last Thursday and Friday as well. Uh, tech shares, yes, you guessed it. And the broad S&P 500 index were, all, were boosted by um, NVIDIA again. It seems like I'm talking about it every week, but it rallied 4% on Friday, 4%. Um, and that's now pushed NVIDIA up above the 2 trillion mark. Um, uh, and it's gained, well, I, I think we mentioned it last week, but now its gain is about is 66% since the start of 2024. Uh, and that's following a gain of, I don't know, what was it, 230 odd percent in 2023. And when you talk about gains like this of a stock, people think you're referring to a penny share or, you know, some sort of non relevant stock. But NVIDIA is the third largest stock in the US. To go up 4% in a day is extraordinary. 66% since the start of this year. It's only nine weeks. Um, anyway, on to other markets. Very impressive NVIDIA. That's all down to the AI frenzy, I suppose you could call it. Yeah, and also, yeah, it is. Uh, absolutely. You had some really good Q4 results the other other week, as as we discussed that last last Monday. Uh, and I think this AI frenzy, it's not like crypto frenzy. AI is real and will be providing tangible benefits. And it, it is already as opposed to crypto, which I don't know, doesn't provide any benefit unless you bought it at the year dot and it's now what, 60,000 bucks or whatever on Bitcoin. But it, it, it it's the it, AI really is the real deal. How it gets used, whether it can, ju whether you can justify Nvidia being worth over two trillion dollars—that's another matter. Um, UK markets are, yeah, I've had a question about them. Not doing so good last week. Uh, I think they basically did pretty well the previous week, as you can see just on the chart here. Uh, yeah, I, th I think budget expectations have caused some sectors to tread a little bit cautiously. Um, We've got the UK, um, you know, the the, the uh, spring budget announcement, uh, and the, there have been various leaks about the various cost savings and targeted tax rises. I think they've been looking at holiday let, non-dom status. They've also been heavily trailed in the media. So I think it sounds like the Chancellor's trying to reward people in work, which is always a good idea. Uh, but that's uh, a little bit of a drag on the UK market and probably will be until... Um, uh, the budget is out the way and I think it's, what is it, 12.30 on Wednesday? Something like that, 12.30, normally takes about an hour. Uh, anyway, currencies very quickly, have a look at the euro, which is uh, a bit of a proxy for the US dollar uh, index, as it were. Well, certainly 
this one against the, the US dollar. Interest rate expectations are the reasons why currencies ebb and flow largely, and they continue to dominate foreign exchange pricing. Um, the readjustment in the outlook for US interest rates over the past eight weeks, and what I mean by that is that the market has now come more in line with Fed thinking. Do you remember at the beginning of the year, the Federal Reserve was saying there's going to be three rate rises this year and the markets were expecting seven, no more. This readjustment has taken place over the last eight weeks, which has largely run its course, has resulted in recovery in the US dollar. Why has the dollar gone up on the back of interest rates not being cut as much? Well, if interest rates are not being cut as much, uh, if you hold your money in US dollars, you're going to get a better return than you would have done at the beginning of the year if the market had got its way. And that's really what we've seen. Uh, to the extent to which other central banks, such as the European Central Bank, which is reporting this week, and the Bank of England are expected to cut rates this year, is also part of the same theme, if you know what I mean. Uh, the US dollar uh, pretty much held on to uh, its gains or its, its position last week. And I think that's really because we're awaiting the outcome of that ECB policy meeting this week. And then we've got the Bank of England, I think, in a couple of weeks. Um, and I think any sign of increased hawkishness from the ECB, from the Governing Council, I think would push the euro higher. What I mean by hawkishness, hawkishness is where a central bank is more inclined to raise rates. Dovishness, if something, if, a, if, if an interest rate policy is dovish, it means it's less likely for interest rates to go higher. So we, we don't want to see a sudden uh, increased hawkishness from uh, Christine Lagarde and her governing council at the Euro, uh, European Central Bank, because uh, that would then push the euro higher. Do, why don't they want the euro higher? Well, uh, having a higher currency uh, can offset inflation, having a lower currency can import inflation. So the reasons why um, central banks have a, a, a keen eye on their respective currencies, but they're not allowed to manipulate them. That's against the rules, the rules of the game, not allowed to competitively devalue or revalue your currency. Um, right, quickly then, gold. We were talking about gold. Who was asking about gold? Owen. You want to know why gold? Well, gold actually jumped last Friday. It was a huge jump. I think it was in delayed reaction to that PCE inflation data, Owen. Um, and that was released Thursday, wasn't it? I think one of the big costs associated with holding gold is financing costs. What I mean by financing costs, I'm saying if, if you've got gold and you've invested I don't know, say you're a fund manager and you invested 100 million in gold. The opportunity cost is if you put that money on deposit, you'd have had a return. The fact is, it's costing you to finance that gold or the opportunity cost. On top of that, you've also got insurance and warehousing costs. But if interest rates are less likely to, to, to more likely to come down, that's beneficial to gold. And that's really, I think, what we saw last week. Um, any sign that interest rates could be coming down sooner is helping gold. Uh, and obviously, in, in addition, I think gold is continuing to uh, reflect these sort of escalating tensions in the Middle East. I say escalating, uh, it's really these stalled talks between Hamas and Israel, which uh, I think are designed to bring about a, a six-week uh, ceasefire, but there are quite a few uh, problems in that uh, in those talks. Uh, does the ECB move the market more than the UK? Yeah, it definitely does. Uh, oh, and the, the European Central Bank is uh, uh, will have a lot bigger impact because it's one central bank for the uh, whole of the Eurozone. Um, although the Bank of England is very highly regarded as well, despite <laughs> having, <laughs> uh, having its forecast not that brilliant. I don't know why central banks are always forecasting things, but I suppose that's part of their job, but they don't tend to get it right. Neither does the European Central Bank either, by the way. Um, but I'd say that the European Central Bank is more key to the markets, global markets, than the Bank of England. So we'll get on to that in a, in a, in, in a uh, second. Oil, well, oil, uh, firmer last week, up uh, yeah, a couple of bucks, actually, uh, close to 3%. You've probably heard last night, OPEC plus 
has made an announcement about a further extension of these production cuts work, which were invoked in was it August 22. Anyway, they were due to expire at the end of this month. Everyone expected OPEC to extend these price uh, production cuts. Uh, so the effect has been pretty muted, really. Uh, as you can see, oil was up on Friday in anticipation of OPEC making this announcement. OPEC's made the announcement, but it's still up. We were this uh, UK oil or Brent uh, settled at 83 bucks on Friday night. It's about 83.47, so it's up, uh, you know, 45, uh, 50 cents per barrel at the moment. Um, yeah, and also. I guess Middle East tensions will also play their part in OPEC's um, price. But think about where OPEC, uh, where the price of oil is. Um, OPEC was hoping to target $100 a barrel oil, and that's how they're positioning their uh, production cuts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we're way below that. I know oil has actually rebounded somewhat over the last um, uh, few weeks, but it's just nowhere near $100, which is really where OPEC was targeting. So you need to go back. Yeah, you need to go back a long way. Yeah. So, yeah, August, July, August. Well, yeah, around that time, middle of uh, 2022. Anyway, anyway, uh, that's uh, what's going on in the markets. Uh, let's have a look at the calendar. Um, the first major central bank policy decision this month. Uh, not surprising, we're only on the 4th of March. Um, and this is the European Central Bank this week. I hope if I get onto the right week, week beginning the 3rd. Um, we've also got non-farm employment report. Um, it's normally the first Friday of the new month, but last Friday was the 1st of March, but it's far too soon for the Bureau of Labour Statistics to get the data out. So uh, it's coming out this Friday. So Friday the 8th, you've got non-farm employment data, really important employment data uh, in the US. Unlike other central banks, the US central bank called the Federal Reserve, um, it has two mandates. One mandate, like every other central bank, is to maintain price stability. What do we mean by that? It's, that's inflation. Uh, they've, they've got to keep prices stable. When prices jump, like they have done over the last couple of years, uh, central banks have to act, and that's why they've pushed interest rates up. But they also, in the US, they have to foster full employment question is what's full employment is is that zero uh, unemployment rate no because you need a natural amount of number of people looking for work for a fluid jobs market uh, but put it this way when the unemployment rate was around 3.3 3.4 percent as it was last year in the us that uh, is uh, pretty close to full employment uh, anyway let's have a quick look as to what else is coming out. Um, okay, we've had Swiss inflation out already. That has actually affected the uh, Swiss franc. Um, actually, it's the largest month-on-month -month, uh, gain in inflation in Switzerland since uh, March last year. Well, there you go. Put that one in your pipe. Uh, Tuesday, uh, we have this thing called the Cakes in Services PMI. This is um, uh, a private company that uh, surveys a bit like S&P Global. Um, they are not the state, the Chinese state. So often people look at this a little more closely uh, or accept it more on face value. And um, yeah, I, all I would say to that is recovering. Um, services well above 50 now uh, and a further jump expected from 52.7 the previous month to 52.9. It's a big problem in China. They have got deflation. Yes, deflation, prices are falling. They've got falling property prices. They've got a real problem in China. Their growth is nothing like what's expected. And they've got their is it People's Congress sometime this month, which is, uh, well, in a non-democratic, democratic sort of way, they sort of talk about what they're doing, but they tell people what they're doing and no one has any input into what they're doing. Um, uh, anyway, um, We've then got this uh, chap called Ueda, who's the uh, governor of the Bank of Japan. He's speaking at some uh, summit, the Fin Sum 24, it's called in Tokyo. The reason why we like to know what central banks, uh, central bankers, uh, when they're speaking, is because often they'll say something about monetary policy, which then affects our markets. And 
you might think, well, what's the Japanese cap going to affect? Well, it will affect the Japanese yen. So any yen pairs you've got, just make a note. You know, uh, it'll be happening early Tuesday morning. You'll wake up in the morning and see the effects of any comments he has uh, made. And then we jump to uh, one of these PMI data. This time it's from the Institute of Supply Management. We get lots of data about services are really important in most developed economies. They're far bigger than manufacturing. Here in the UK, only 20% of our economy is manufacturing. The rest is services. We're a very service orientated um, economy. Uh, in the US, it's less so, but it's still a dominant sector by far compared to manufacturing. Uh, and they're expecting a uh, modest a contraction in uh, services from last month's 53.4. And the dollar will be a little bit sensitive to that as well. Uh, we also have on Tuesday, not here, written here for some reason. Anyway, it's called Super Tuesday. Super, super Tuesday. Uh, it's the primaries in the US. It's in a bunch of states. Um, looks like the Republican Party are almost certain to choose Trump as their nomination for uh, the presidential, as their candidate for the presidential election in November. Uh, Trump polling, according to the US press over the weekend, 47% would vote for Trump, 45% for Biden. Um, and that's narrowed, apparently, uh, by 3%. Uh, Nikki Haley continues to fight the uh, Republican uh, nomination battle, saying that why is the US only able to choose between two octogenarians? And it's a good point, actually. Um, anyway, I don't think she's going to go anywhere. She did win the Washington State over the weekend, but uh, very small, not very significant. Probably likely to be the only one she's going to win as well. Uh, Wednesday. Uh, we've got this construction PMI data, not normally something I talk about, but the construction sector here in the UK has struggled since, gosh, the second half of 2022. But it looks like it's he heading towards some sort of recovery, anything above 50. And it starts to, you know, to improve. So uh, it's been a long old road there. Uh, the spring budget is uh, also happening. That's referred here to as the annual budget release. Uh, we call it the spring budget announcement uh, or just budget. Uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer is expected to deliver his speech around half 12. Uh, roughly, he stands up in Parliament and it takes about an hour. Uh, sterling will be particularly sensitive to and UK assets, so gilts and uh, UK equities uh, will be pretty, particularly sensitive to the details announced. Um, I won't go into any of them. There's lots of talk about how he's going to deliver a two percent a two uh, yeah a 2p cut in um uh, either two percent cut in either national insurance or um income tax uh, more likely to be national insurance but we'll wait and see uh, we then have the uh, adp non-farm employment change a big week for that employment data this uh, in the us uh, this is the precursor to the main uh, pièce de résistance on Friday. It's produced by a private payroll company, which has their own take on non-farm employment. The market looks at it, but not too closely, because it can be a particularly volatile read from uh, ADP, a lot more volatile than the official data published on Friday. But the dollar will be a little bit sensitive to it if it is a bit out of uh, whack. Uh, problem NI cut doesn't help pensioners. Michael, you're quite right. It doesn't. And he's, the, you know, the stated aim from Jeremy Hunt and the and and the Tory Party seems to help. They want to help people in work, and being someone who is 65 this year, that may not be helping me. But I sort of get it. Um, that, you know, I, I look at my daughter who's recently had a her first child and her, her husband. They had this, you know, it's it's a tough time they've got this cliff edge with child benefit and stuff like that um and i sort of feel more for them than myself maybe <laughs> but i i do understand it doesn't help pensioners you're quite right but they do have this triple lock still that it that both tory and labor parties seemed absolutely determined to protect um anyway adp uh so we we talked about the uh, annual budget. Uh, we've also got an interest rate decision. I forgot to mention that at the beginning. That's the Bank of 
Canada, BOC. So they've got their uh, policy announcement. So the um, their monthly policy announcement, no change in rates expected, as you can see. So the overnight rate staying at 5% compared to the last month. They are trailed. To, they are expected to cut rates at some stage, a bit like in the US, but they're certainly not going to make any decision ahead of the Federal Reserve decision uh, on the 20th of March because they're very close to each other, Canada bordering the US, obviously. Uh, there's, uh, they do track each other quite closely. Uh, we then got um, Jay Powell. Uh, testifying to Congress. This is happens twice a year, the semi-annual monetary policy report. Uh, he has to testify to Congress uh, and it's day one of two days this week. So the next one uh, after Wednesday will be on Thursday. And it's interesting because if, if he gives us any further insights into Fed thinking, re-interest rates, always helpful. Yes, please. Uh, dollar, dollar assets, all sensitive to that. Any, anything that can affect interest rates, we want to know about as traders as and investors. Um, then uh, a key uh, announcement being the um, European Central Bank rate decision. Apologies to the Bank of Canada, I did completely forget about that, but no change expected from the uh, European Central Bank. And you might think, so that's no big deal. Well, the market will definitely focus on any clues from the governing council about the timing of future rate cuts. When you look at what's happening in the Eurozone compared to the US. Do you look at what's happening in the UK compared to the US? It's chalk and cheese. They've got to do something in the Eurozone and they've got to do something in the UK. I suspect interest rates might well be cut earlier than some analysts have been forecasting. So any clues that we might get from um, the uh, policy statement, but then also, more importantly, the press conference that's held at 1.45. Uh, so the euro and eurozone assets will be very sensitive to that. And apropos your comment, Owen, about um, is the ECB move, does it move the market more than the, the, the Bank of England? Absolutely. And it's really important that we look at that and, and make a note of that um, time of that announcement because the ECB will affect global markets not as much as the Federal Reserve, uh, but more so than the Bank of England, as I say. So uh, uh, that will be interesting Thursday at lunchtime. And then, as I said, the uh, chair of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, has got a second day's worth of testimony in front of the uh, uh, committee at, uh, in Congress. Uh, we've also got this FOMC member, FOMC, that's the rate setting committee from the Federal Reserve, the US Central Bank, and one of the members, Mester, is um, speaking at some sort of online event. Um, I think it's got Virtual European Economics and Financial Centre's Distinguished Speaker Series. I only wrote it down because I thought, that's just ridiculous. What, who came up with a title like that? Anyway, it's about the economic outlook. So that could be interesting, especially there is uh, because there is an audience Q&A session at the end of it. So um, if you want to log on to the uh, European Economics and Financial Centre's Distinguished Speaker Series, ask him what he's going to do with interest rates. What his vote's going to be? We'd like to know. Uh, and then um, an equal piece de resistance uh, on the same sort of uh, level of interest as the European Central Bank is the uh, uh, non-farm employment change, which uh, is that curious title. Uh, we just call it unemployment data or employment data. It's called non-farm. We all know why. If those of you who are new don't know why, it's because the farming sector is very seasonal. So they remove the farm sector jobs because it distorts the numbers too much. So it's called non-farm employment change. Um, and we're looking for a dip uh, from last, just do you remember last month's just extraordinary number, which also had the previous month's number increased as well? Um, I can't believe for a minute we'll be anywhere near that. I wonder whether it will be less than 190k because it'll be some sort of adjustment. But uh, anyway, that's what uh, the consensus is with an unemployment rate at 3.7%, the same as last month. And the other thing that the Federal Reserve will be looking at is wage growth, average hourly earnings. So coming in a lot slower than the previous month. God knows what was happening in that data. But anyway, um, maybe there'll be a readjust, adjustment back down. Who knows? Uh, obviously, the dollar, uh, other currencies, 
dollar assets, eurozone assets, UK assets, global assets will be very sensitive to this, to this release. So uh, that is a very, very important number. 1.30 Friday, whatever you do, put that one in your uh, diary. For, uh, absolutely, very, 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 very important. Um, it is a busy week, actually, Ern. Um, when you've got interest rate decisions and employment data, you know, uh, it doesn't come much busier than this in a way, and apologies for whittling on a bit longer than uh, uh, I intended to, but it, it is important that you keep, uh, make a note of all of those. Um, elections are also very important, and this is the year of democracy or supposed democracy, but there are a number of so-called democracies like in Russia, I say so-called, China, um, India, uh, Iran, do you see the Iranian um, participation was only 40%, uh, not not really democracies, and they, they exclude all those uh, people they regard as not suitable candidates, i.e. people who might win the election. Always a bit bizarre, really. Anyway, thanks very much for listening. Uh, Paul, absolute pleasure. Thanks very much. I'm glad you have found it interesting. Uh, do have a, a profitable rest of the week. Uh, I will reconvene with you on Next Monday, good luck with the trading. Enjoy that sunny weather. Have a good rest of the week. All the best. Bye for now.